Welcome everyone to the second webinar of Combinement in collaboration with the Virtual Physiological Human Institute. Uh, my name is Britt van Roy, I'm from the University of uh, Amsterdam and I will be uh, the host of the webinar. So what is Combiomed? So Combiomed is a user-driven center of excellence in computational biomedicine. And today's lecture will be about introduction to cloud computing for the virtual physiological human. Uh, our speakers of today are Ander Astudio and Alessandro Melles. So Ander works for Surfsara uh, in the Netherlands as a consultant. Uh, he helps uh, scientists uh, with IT problems and uh, develops software and infrastructure for research. Uh, and Alessandro is a postdoc uh, in mechanical engineering at the University of Sheffield and is in Signio Institute, for in, and that's the Institute for In Silico Medicine. Uh, he's currently working for, uh, so working in the Combiomet project on uh, work, numerical workflows uh, on HPC platforms. So uh, before we start with uh, Ander, I would like to mention if you have any questions, uh, please uh, type, the, type the questions in, in, in the question tab. Uh, in the GoToWebinar uh, interface. And uh, then now, now it's time to start with our first speaker, Ander. You can start. Uh, thank you, Britt. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, this presentation on um, cloud computing and the way we see it at uh, Surfsara. In fact, uh, Surfsara is the Dutch national e-infrastructure provider for researchers in the Netherlands and among other computing and storage systems that we offer, uh, we have the HPC Cloud. This is a cloud system that we offer already and we've been offering it for uh, several years and it is a very successful one. This is one option that researchers have in the Netherlands. Um, of course, you've always got commercial providers who offer other cloud services as well. Uh, but before we go any further, I would like a small introduction on who we are. Well, Surf Sarah, I just said it. Uh, we are in. We are uh, the resource provider for researchers in the Netherlands. We are sitting in Amsterdam in particular in the science park, as you can see uh, on the slides. And we are since 2013 part of the SURF family, where among others, you've got SURF Sarah, SURFnet and SURF Market. You have probably heard about NWO as the national um, organization for research in the Netherlands. So the eSign Center is also uh, in part of the family together with NWO. So we can finally start talking about cloud computing. The problem usually arises when we talk about cloud computing uh, with defining what cloud computing actually is. And actually, until not so long ago, in Wikipedia, you could read something like cloud computing is a jargon term without a commonly accepted, non-ambiguous scientific or technical definition. So this dates back to July 2013. Uh, of course, since then, lots of uh, effort has been put into using and uh, propagating the concept of cloud in, in terms of cloud computing, also storage. but um, it's difficult actually to define it. The National Institutes for Science and Technology, of Standards and Technology, sorry, uh, actually came up with one definition where they define five essential characteristics. That's how they name them. So you can say that you have a cloud computing environment when you have on demand self service when that system is broadly accessible via the network, when that system actually consists of a pool of resources that can be claimed by users directly, where that system allows the users to benefit from rapid elasticity, 
and of course when you can see how much you're using or if you've been used or you're about to use for me essential characteristics yeah i understand those but actually the key one would be rapid elasticity of course um this would mean that you can claim more whenever you need more and at the moment that you actually need more uh, but it's also key to understand that elasticity makes shrinking also available and that's actually one of the best um, characteristics that you can actually take from a cloud computing system you can grow and shrink as you actually need so you don't have to over provision to actually cater for long uh, for a long time where you are only going to use a bit but if you compare it to traditional to the traditional way that you would um, procure computing resources you would try to buy a bit more than you would normally use so that you could actually allocate some extra peaks in the jargon of cloud computing you've probably heard before as well terms like software as a service platform as a service and infrastructure as a service um, the national institute of standards and technology sees those to be service models and they kind of build on top of each other you can have infrastructure as a service where the user can actually define and describe what his computing system should look like then on top of that uh, if you abstract that layer a bit, you can offer platform as a service where uh, you don't define all the characteristics each of the components should have in your system, but you just use as a user a development environment, if you will. And on top of that, you can offer as a provider software as a service where the user will just use a piece of software that uh, actually offers some functionality at a high level uh, usually something that speaks in the domain the domain of the uh, user itself so um, these concepts can all be a, a bit vague and difficult to get a grasp on uh, the first time you look at them so don't hesitate to ask further on the questions i'm going to touch briefly on the agenda of today um, on my part of the presentation, I will define the cloud computing service that Sursara offers, that is called the HPC Cloud. Then I will explain what the user actually feels and sees when uh, they are using the system. And in the end, I will show a bit of the user interface uh, so that you can actually get a full grasp on an actual system. So Without further ado, let's touch on Surfsara's HPC Cloud service. We started offering the cloud, the HPC Cloud at Surfsara in order to serve certain specifics uh, for scientists. Scientists are our main goal and they are not system gurus and yet they need to compute. So they need to tackle usually complex problems mainly in two parts one thing is data you think on any part of the data processing workflow uh, you start with uh, dirty non-structured data this can be bigger than what you can allocate on your laptop or whatever the local resources you have so think in that area also complexity arises from computation um, you may need to solve problems that would require a lifetime to solve on your laptop or you may have to let different uh, programs coexist and you've only got one uh, machine that you will very easily run into uh, the library's nightmare where you have one program depending on one library and another one depending on another one or the same one but a different version so you've all probably been there and you know how difficult that can be well, if we provide a, a service like the HPC Cloud where you can actually define what you want to install and where and how to chunk each of the components to solve all those possibilities that you also see down there, like test, running trials, developing, starting from the beginning, breaking everything and having to start again, that's very easy. 
So that was the motivation for starting the HPC Cloud. And what do you see then? Well, we offer your own world, of course, a computing world, and that is made available through a virtualization layer. So you can consider yourself as being in a jar when you are in the HPC Cloud system. And of course, it is connected to the internet, which in this analogy I uh, depicted with the universe. So you are in your jar. What can you do in your jar? You can run your computing system. Uh, we call those actually virtual machines. And that means that you define the shape of your hardware. So how many CPUs you want in your machine, how much memory you want to have, the kind of disks and network. Of course you can, but you have to. And that could be one of the uh, parts that may put you off a bit because you also need to install your operating system or configure it, also your programs, your libraries. Uh, but this gives you all the flexibility that you wouldn't have had until uh, you would have had a cloud computing service. Before this, you can think of the only possibility being a cluster which would already be configured for you. You've also probably been there. So it's not only that you can run one virtual machine or instance, as you may have heard it in different cloud providers, but you can run actually many of them. And not only that, you can actually let them communicate and uh, get a bigger problem distributed among different systems. So it's a great place where you can build your cluster with a private network that we offer you and also access to the internet. And because of all this is possible on our HPC cloud, we say that we offer infrastructure as a service, which then uh, in turn, you can tweak and customize to uh, offer platform as a service or infrastructure or software as a service to your possible users in turn. And we are able to do this because we are benefiting from a piece of software called Open Nebula, which is a cloud middleware, which offers uh, all the cluster management so that we can focus on offering the service ourselves. Like I have anticipated, we are not the only ones providing a cloud computing place. I have just made a bunch of screenshots from a website which is actually uh, offering a catalog on cloud services providers. Uh, the most common ones that people usually think about when we're talking cloud computing are Amazon, Azure, and uh, Google. Um, there are many others, as you can see. And of course, uh, the main benefit of coming to a place like Zosara is that you don't only get the computing capacity, but also uh, people like me, we are consultants, uh, we can actually help you and we have also expertise in-house for helping you make the translation between the research world towards the IT computing part. Then more again, if you want to ask questions about this, I'll be happy to answer. Like I said, I've described what you can do in the system, but then how do you actually do it? And then again, what does the system require from you as a user if you are trying to use cloud computing in the HPC cloud? That's for sure. Well, of course, the main goal uh, or the first goal when you're actually starting at the HPC cloud is that you can run your virtual machines in order to have a virtual machine up and running you need to describe what you want to have as a virtual machine. So you need to define the amount of CPUs that you want. You want to um, define the amount of RAM that you want. Again, disks, network. So Open Nebula or the HPC Cloud requires that you specify this in a blueprint called the template. So once you have the template defined, you can instantiate that template to actually create virtual machines. Disks are very important because those are 
an analogy to what you would have in your desktop as hard drives. You can have many of them. You can even have different kinds of disks, like again, depicted here by uh, CD ROMs. And depending on the um, characteristics of these images, you may even instantiate multiple VMs out of a full configuration. So you see, this is very powerful. It allows you to create a lot of uh, complex configurations and all of these in a web interface without having to type any commands. So don't be afraid. And even if you don't want to start configuring everything from scratch, we offer the app market. They are ready-made bundles of templates and images so that you can just click on a web interface. You can get up and running in a matter of minutes. You will have your computing capacity allocated in a cloud, actually our cloud. And even though in different cloud providers, these terms may be called different, the whole basic, the whole basic principles apply everywhere. In particular, I want to stress how relevant it is that you have two kinds of networks. The private network allows you to run your computation in an isolated fashion. So if you have privacy issues with your data, you are totally covered. Um, and you can actually use the internet on other machines that you may have on in your own jar, in your own space. Um, to actually connect and actually make sure that you protect a specific part. So you can actually harness the powerful of having different systems configured at the same time. Of course, this is also a place where you could cooperate with other users of ours, other colleagues of yours, maybe in their own jars, in their own groups, the HPC Cloud. So it's a very nice feature that you can actually use the same system, each of you on your own different particular spaces. And one very nice feature or a direct feature that you can benefit from when you are thinking about the HPC cloud is that you can use the system to actually scale, to make your application use more than you may already have available. And think of your laptop as a quick example. You can scale up, so directly bring kind of the copy of your laptop to a bigger size. Or you can consider that you can have multiple copies of your own laptop. And if your application allows to benefit from this, then you can uh, scale out by having you know, the problem distributed among yeah, not so big computers, but many of them. And this is a very clear example of applications like a Monte Carlo simulation where lots of independent runs of scale can be run at the same time. Successful story so far uh, includes uh, all of the elements that you have on the left column of the slide. So users have actually told us that they love being able to uh, uh, install the software that they want, versions that they want, configure them how they want. Running on big VMs, that is a key feature. So you can have a big laptop or many of them. Uh, elasticity, again, getting more when you need more, getting uh, releasing when you don't need them anymore. You can uh, serve your own programs on the HPC Cloud. So you can have your own users. Uh, run software that requires licenses that we may have uh, that you may have on your own actually uh, complex workflows something you can configure you can deliver training especially courses are something we are doing very often and of course computing and then from all the fields that you can imagine probably have already been using the hpc cloud a sample here on the right biology genetics informatics chemistry ecology linguistics Robotics, business, social sciences, engineering, humanities, water management. And I guess that it's uh, time for the demo now. So I will switch over to my web browser. I'm going to zoom in. 
So this is the web interface. This is just a web browser. I am logged in as this username over here. When you log in, you see a dashboard. Uh, you can see what has been used in this group. Now again, this overview of your job, analogy to the presentation. In the storage tab down here, there is an apps section and you see a menu with already pre-made of images and templates, if you can relate to my previous presentation. And for example, you can get this app. You can click on this button to start importing it to your space. I am going to give it a name. I need to choose of the two kinds of storage that we have available. Ceph is a shared storage. It's not the best place to install your apps. So I'm going to choose the other one. Click on download. And I get immediate feedback telling me I've got images. In this case, this is the one I just imported. And I'm sorry, this is the one I just imported. And you can see it's locked, which means it's being copied to my space. The template, you can see the templates I already have in this workspace. And again, this one is the one I just imported. And while the image is being imported, I can review the characteristics I mentioned in my slides. So you can change here the amount of memory that you can, uh, that you would like to have on a virtual machine that you will eventually instantiate from this VM, from this template. Uh, the amount of CPUs that you want, say I want two CPUs. Storage. I have all these images. This is the same list that I could see here on the left, but now related to the possibility of attaching them to a template that I am editing at the moment. I've got one network card attached and it's connected to the internet. So you've got the two networks I have at the moment. One available network is the internet. Another available network is the internal one with int. And other elements that you could configure. I don't think it's relevant that we update it. Let me check that now. So just remember, I have changed the amount of memory and CPUs I want to have on my VM. I'm going to submit the changes by clicking the update button. Let's see whether my image is already copied. Yes, it's not imported. It's not locked anymore. It's ready. So I can actually come back to my uh, templates list. Click here at uh, the template that I want to instantiate and click on instantiate. I give it a name. And I am going to click on instantiate. On my instances list, the VMs list should have my first VM. As expected, now it's in status prolog. If I refresh, in a bit, I should be getting a uh, running virtual machine. You can click here to see more details. It's actually running right now. Just to make sure we can verify the capacity showing the two CPUs and four gigs are required. And if I actually click on this little television icon, I can even log in. So I have logged in to a remote desktop. You can see here I've got my start menu and I can even start my terminal and I can do, so this is just for uh, people who may not be familiar with this. This is a light version, lightweight version of Ubuntu with a lightweight 
window manager. So even though you recognize this is Ubuntu, trust me, <laughs> you can run here and things like So this is a responsive system and it's uh, totally provisioned. From here on, you could start your own software and configuration. Um, I'm going to switch over to the presentation because this concludes my presentation. I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Alessandro Meris. I'm at the Insignium, the Institute for Insidico Medicine, and I'm working as a postdoc at the University of Sheffield in the Department of Mechanical Engineering uh, for the Combiomed project. Um, Insignium is one of the Europe's largest research institutes dedicated to the development and use of insidico medicine technologies. And what I'm going to show you today is one of our uh, software, uh, which is called OpenBF, and I'm going to give you a brief introduction about the, the use of OpenBF in our group and the TPR application you can you can use it for, and also why we use the uh, cloud computing or Sarsara to solve uh, one of our problems. So OpenBF is a cardiovascular um, simulator. What you can do with it is to uh, simulate um, pulse pressure uh, in all the main arteries of the cardiac uh, uh, cir circulation. Um, and these are shown here in this slide. These are mainly the, the, the largest and the most elastic arteries in your body. Uh, OpenBF is a numerical solver. It's based on other stocks, so it's physically based and is only 1D. So you don't get any uh, very accurate uh, information about the fluid structure, but you, you have some uh, high-level information about pressure and flow rate in, in all the arteries. Uh, it was written in uh, Julia, so it's pretty straightforward to read even uh, the code and is released as an open source software on uh, GitHub. So you are free to uh, download and um, use it for your, your own work. Um, so the, the basic building block of, of uh, OpenBF is the single artery. So you, you can imagine your circulation as built by uh, several small arteries. Uh, these are uh, defined by their, their length, their in, inner diameter, and also by the mechanical properties of, of the walls, uh, because arteries are very elastic and can displace in the, in the radial uh, direction. Um, in number yes, you have to assign all of these properties to, to each artery in your body. And to do that, you have several files you have to, to, to fill in. Uh, one is a comma separated value file, uh, where for each artery you have the length, internal radius, young modulus, and thickness of uh, the artery. And then you have also a constant .jl file uh, which includes uh, the blood properties. So, you know, you may have uh, different properties of blood, such as density and viscosity, depending on, uh, um, on, on your patient or even on the, the place in the world you, uh, you're measuring the blood properties. Once you define a single vessel, you can use it as a, as a building block for a more complicated network. In uh, here on the right hand side, we have a complete model of uh, the, the greater circulation. And uh, as you can see, you can use a single vessel in series so that you have a conjunction. So you can make a very long section of your network by adding more of these vessels, 
or you can uh, create bifurcations. So from one vessel, you diverge into two, two daughter vessels. Or on the other end, you can do the, the opposite. You can converge from two parent vessels to one daughter vessel. And we call this configuration astomosis. And this is something you can uh, see, especially in the cerebral vasculature. Uh, again, this uh, network topology should be uh, included in the model.csv uh, file. Uh, to conclude the model description, you need to uh, assign also boundary condition. So if you think about your, uh, your vasculature, you have the heart at the beginning. And here we are modeling the heart as a time varying function of uh, the flow rate out of the heart. So uh, this function is telling you how uh, much blood uh, is flowing through uh, the valve uh, at each time uh, step in the in the cardiac cycle, and this is again is given as a, a discretized uh, function in in a in a file for your model. What you will get once you run uh, one simulation with OpenBF is the description of uh, the time uh, dependent pressure in all the vessels. And as you can see on the right hand side, uh, depending on the location in your uh, circulation, you have very different uh, waveforms. And these are very interesting from the clinical point of view because you can do what we call the, the pulse wave analysis. So you can uh, analyze all these waves, you can study the components of the waves and depending on the the vascular condition you're, you're you're studying you may find correlations between different components of the wave and the cardiovascular condition and uh, an additional thing you can do with the, the simulator is to simulate the, the cardiovascular condition. So let's say you, you first do a simulation for your uh, healthy subject. So you have a, base, a baseline waveform. Then you can start playing with all the parameters in your model. So you can you can even get rid of some arteries in uh, in your model and see how the waveform is changing. And and what we can do is to compare the healthy, uh, healthy subject with, uh, with a pathology uh, in, in a different simulation. And in this way, you can try to infer from real measurements what, what, what is going on in, in, in that patient. Now, the next step is instead of looking only at one uh, single patient, is to run simulations for the entire population. So if you remember all the parameters you were, uh, uh, you were um, uh, setting for a single patient, you can start varying those parameters within ranges. So you can go in literature and find uh, what's the range of uh, um, aorta radius uh, among the population. And you can do that for all the arteries uh, so that you can have a very, very uh, large input space. And you want to explore this input space so that you know uh, the, the shape of the waveforms for different kind of person in the, um, in the population. And once you have your healthy population, you can do the same uh, of the previous study. So you can try to test your clinical hypothesis on the population itself. And we did this study with uh, Surfsara Cloud. So we managed to run uh, simulations for an entire population of healthy subjects. And what we got uh, uh, were these distributions of um, 
standard uh, uh, clinical biomarkers such as you know, pulse pressure in your uh, arm, for example, is something that uh, the GP uh, measures every time. And, and this was already a good uh, uh, result for our simulations. Now the next step would be to try to simulate a condition all over the population. Now these results were done thanks to uh, the cloud support uh, for a very simple reason. So for a complete vascular model, a single simulation can take up to 20 minutes. But for the population study, we required at least 15,000 of these simulations. So if you do a really simple calculation, you will end up with 200 days of uh, runtime on my desk, uh, desktop computer in my office. And that was not feasible, of course, because that was only the first step. So if we want to do another 15,000 simulations, would be another year of uh, simulation, which is not acceptable. So we used uh, an embarrassing parallel strategy. That means we were running most of the 15,000 simulation at the same time. And, and this could be done only thanks to the cloud because we could have a better hardware than my own computer in the office, of course, but, uh, more, um, but we could also have more cores on that virtual machine. So we, we constructed several uh, multi-core virtual machines and we reduced the time, the, the total computational time uh, to one day, uh, more or less. So uh, this was something that we couldn't do uh, with our computers in, uh, in our office. Now, what, oops, what I'd like to do now is uh, just a little demo on how OpenBF works and how easy it is to install it on the on a cloud uh, virtual machine. Uh, so I'm going to show you um, how to to install a few packages you need for uh, OpenBF uh, to run and also the OpenBF uh, installation itself. I have a virtual machine already. Uh, running on uh, Sarah Cloud, and what they can do is simply to uh, connect uh, to it through my uh, terminal. Just So if this is correct, yes. So now I'm inside the, the virtual machine and basically I can use it as it was my own computer. So for example, I can install uh, VGET, which is something I need to to install OpenBF. Of course, I already done it, but that's, this was just to show you how to do it. And, and now I can clone OpenBF directly from GitHub repository. So this will create a folder OpenBF in my home uh, directory. And what is already provided with OpenBF is an installation script for Ubuntu. There are also scripts for Windows uh, if you want to use on that. And this script will download directly Julia, uh, the right version of Julia uh, with which OpenBF was written and it will copy all Julia files and also OpenBF files in the right folders in your system. So at this point, Julia should work. You, you can use uh, 
the command line on here and also in OpenVF it's here and you can uh, call it directly uh, from command line. So I prepared a small test with OpenVF. It's just a simple bifurcation, but it will be enough to, to show the potentiality of the software. Um, so I was telling you about all the files you need to, to prepare for this, uh, this simulation. And here we have all of them. So there is the comma separated value file, which contains for each vessel in your system, there are some informations about it. So it's the length and the radii, and Young's modulus and so on. Then you have also your constants file, which contains information about the blood properties. And also, since this is a numerical solver, you, you have to you have some commands to, to control the, the numerical solver. Uh, eventually, you have also the inlet boundary condition, which is described by this time function. So you have two columns. Left hand side, you have your time. So it's very finely discretized in here. And on the right hand side, you have the volumetric flow rate, so your heart model. If you want to run an OpenBF simulation, you can call the solver uh, through this command. It will start building the arterial network and it will start simulating. So what it's doing now is to uh, is to uh, trying to converge uh, along the, the, the cardiac cycle. And as soon as the error is less than 5%, it stops and uh, you can you can uh, find the results in the same folder. So now you have a bifurcation underscore results folder. And what this also provides is, is a very small plot um, function. Uh, this is written in, uh, in uh, Python. So I installed uh, a very small Python uh, version here through uh, Anaconda and so that I can plot this and yeah here it is so for all your simulations basically what you will get it is a collection of waves uh, along your system and uh, in this case since you have uh, three uh, vessels, you have three locations and uh, and you have different quantities you can actually uh, monitor. So the pressure, uh, volumetric flow rate and also the displacement of the wall. So as you can see, depending on the location you are, uh, you have different waves. And from this point on, you can do all the wave uh, analysis you, you want on, on these results. Uh, but this is something you can do even on uh, on your uh, computer. What, what is really interesting in the, in the cloud is that this virtual machine is a 20 cores uh, machine with 8 gigs of, of RAM. Uh, so it's uh, already more powerful than my uh, laptop. And so with 24 cores, we can actually uh, send 24 simulations at the same time. And to show this, I prepared another very small uh, simulation. So here, again, we have the same, we have the same uh, input files and I have a, a small script that prepares 24 
24 folders uh, in which I have a copy of these um, input files. So if I just do this, you see I have again the same files. And, and I can send all the simulations all together in with just one common. I'm using this uh, bash common parallel to send all of them. And basically here I'm telling the, the computer to go inside each of these folders and run OpenBF on the bifurcation uh, simulation. And I'm also dumping all the standard output to uh, a log file. And now uh, I send the job and I can actually see in here that I have 24 instances of Julia running at the, at the same time. And ideally this should uh, be finishing at the same time uh, after about 30, 30 seconds uh, as the, the first simulation, the, the single simulation uh, went. So yeah, and they are finishing now. Yeah. So this concludes my uh, very small demo on uh, OpenBF. And now, if you have any questions of OpenBF or the of the uh, Server Sara Cloud, please feel free to to uh, to ask. Thank you. I would like to uh, thank the speakers for this talk webinar and uh, thank you for attending all uh, this webinar. Uh, the material, so the slides of this webinar and also the recording will be back on the Combiomat web pages. And uh, thank you very much. Hope to see you in the next webinar from Combiomat. Thank you.